More now in the revelations in that pre preliminary report on the disappearance of Malaysia Airlines Flight 370, specifically regarding some of the cargo, what was traveling along with the 239 passengers and crew. The flight manifest showing nearly 2,500 kilos or about 5,400 pounds of lithium batteries. Now, initially back in March, the airline CEO said the amount was 200 kilos, less than a tenth as much. Either way, this stuff is, is not manufactured. If it's not manufactured right and handled properly, it can cause a lot of damage, as Randy Kay found out. At 30,000 feet, this laptop may be enough to bring down a jumbo jet. Watch closely. It's about to catch fire. Oh, my God! Inside is a lithium battery. Please stay away from the computer. When it gets too hot, it ignites, just like this FAA training video demonstrates. In the last two decades or so, the FAA reports more than 140 incidents involving batteries in cargo or baggage. In most cases, the batteries were undeclared. Baggage handlers noticed luggage on fire or hot to the touch. On board, laptops, even flashlights started to smoke. Even though lithium batteries can cause this, they are still allowed in electronics in the passenger cabin. But in 2008, the FAA banned loose batteries in checked luggage. A limited amount of batteries are still allowed to be checked if packaged properly. The concern is they could short circuit. A short circuit can happen by chance. Say a loose battery in a person's checked luggage comes into contact with keys or coins or even jewelry. That can create a circuit or a path for electricity. The current flowing through that short circuit creates extreme heat, leading to sparks and fire. Lithium batteries burn so hot they can melt the body of a plane. Nothing brings the fear of God to a pilot like having a fire or smoke in the airplane. You just can't pull off to the side of the road and hop out like you can in a car. This YouTube video shows how quickly lithium batteries can fuel a chain reaction. In 2006, fire forced a UPS plane to make an emergency landing in Philadelphia. Investigators found electronics containing lithium batteries in the cargo. The pilots survived. And this is what was left of a UPS plane after it crashed in Dubai in 2010. The Boeing 747 was carrying 80 to 90,000 lithium batteries. A chain reaction fire filled the cockpit with smoke. Both pilots died. Following the UPS crash in 2010, the FAA wanted to tighten the rules on battery shipments in cargo planes too, even classify them as dangerous goods. Industry groups and lobbyists fought back hard. The final compromise, approved by Congress in 2012, blocked proposed tougher federal rules on transporting lithium batteries on planes, instead relying on international standards set by the UN. Randy Kay, CNN, New York. And we're back with Miles O'Brien and Richard Quest and David Susi. As we said, uh, it, it's really interesting. I mean, when you look at this report, and we're going to put it up on the screen, on the cargo manifest that was released today by the Malaysians, it says, quote, the package contains lithium-ion batteries. You know, David, when you we look back at all we know about this flight, how big a concern to, to you are those things? I mean, well, how many not, questions does it raise? It's not only about this flight. It's about those previous flights, as she was talking about, 3707. These batteries are very volatile. They put off gases, hydrogen chloride. They put off sulf, uh, sulfuric acid. If, when you look at those flames that are coming out of those batteries, mm -hmm. it's, it's those gases that are burning and flaming and causing that damage. That goes very, very hot. Burns very, very hot. It's interesting, though, Richard. I mean, Malaysian Airlines earlier had said that this was in compliance with all international regulatory requirements and said they were non dangerous goods. That doesn't mean, though, that they aren't potentially dangerous. No, it doesn't mean they're not potentially dangerous, and it, but it, the, the way bill makes it clear. The package must be handled with care, a flammable hazard exists, etc., etc. My understanding is that these were packaged in accordance with the uh, procedures, and they were in the back of the aircraft in the, uh, not that that uh, make, makes a huge amount of difference, but, uh, but the, everything I've been told about these lithium ion batteries is that they do not believe they were a cause of anything going wrong. But, but therein lies the problem. They met those standards. Well, let's look at the standards. We have higher standards here in the United States. They can't be on passenger aircraft like that. They can't be that bulked would, together. This amount of batteries would not be on a no, passenger not, aircraft not, in the United not States. A, except on cargo aircraft. That's right. where you'd put it on cargo aircraft, especially 5,000 pounds worth of them. You know, 
Miles, go what, Miles? I, I got to tell you, I burned a lithium battery in a hotel room, and it practically, it practically burned down the entire hotel room. And <laughs> Why the were you doing that? <laughs> I, I was charging up batteries and gear, and it was, it was not a pretty scene. And all I can tell you is, I don't want to fly with those batteries beneath me, and I think that's a very good rule. And just because Malaysia Air says they were packed well and they were in the back, do we really know that? Do right. I mean, really know that? I mean, to your David Susi, you had talked earlier to somebody who had checked on the batteries in the pingers and that they weren't even being stored properly in, in a warehouse. Yeah, that's correct. I mean, a different, yeah. obviously it's a different obviously issue, a different but, situation, but, but I mean, if, if they're not storing ba one batteries correctly, how do we know for sure that they're packaging these things correctly? Well, it is two different uh, divisions. You've got the maintenance division, which is the guy I had talked to it was doing the surveillance on that. Mm -hmm. He wasn't doing the cargo. But as you recall, uh, maybe a month ago or so, we talked about how many reported incidents there were with these batteries, most of them in loading or taking off, because that's when they're most vulnerable uh, to to some kind of damage is when they're being put on the aircraft by a forklift or right. any kind of other metal that's going on the airplane. You know, Miles, when you look at where this plane disappeared, and, and there was a, a thing, a mention of this in, uh, in the Wall Street Journal, one person familiar with, with, the, uh, with, with the investigation said to the Wall Street Journal that, that it all might be a coincidence, but if you were choosing the one moment in the flight to go dark, this moment right when it was getting to Vietnamese airspace was the moment, that, that, that if it was a technical failure, it's a pretty extraordinary coincidence. To that, yeah. you say what? Well, the handoffs are the, the opportunity for something like this to happen. Because there is this period of time when one guy has said goodnight and the other guy is supposed to pick up the ball. And during that period of time, each, thinks, each person thinks the other is talking to the aircraft. And so if you wanted to disappear, that's the time to do it. There's an opportunity there. You know, you talk about this 17 minutes of time before Ho Chi Minh City started wondering where the plane was. That's, that's a long period of time, but not unprecedented as part of the routine course mm. of action in handoffs on a day-to-day -day basis. Yeah. Uh, so it, it, it happens. It is an opportunity time. Uh, Miles O'Brien, good to have you on. David Sue's quest as well. Up next, breaking news: the director.